All right, I mean, most of you probably thought, hey, is that Luke Skywalker coming up? Does he have a lightsaber coming up on the stage? Sorry to disappoint you, you're stuck with me this morning, a U.S. Army soldier. So uh, I'm glad to be here today, this morning, and uh, maybe more of a, a better character might have been Darth Vader, what do you think? But uh, hey, this is a great morning, and uh, we certainly have had, uh, uh, had a busy few weeks to include this past week at the Space Symposium in Colorado Springs, so it's nice to take a pause and join our Total Force teammates here in Las Vegas on a beautiful Sunday morning. Do I hear a hua? Hua? Uh, we might have to try that one more time. Hua. All right. So Angie and I thank you for the warm welcome and really the terrific hospitality. And also thanks to my good friend Dan Hokinson as well as Kelly for the kind invitation and General McGuire for that gracious introduction. Thank you for not going through my bio. Uh, a lot of times that becomes long because I'm old and also becomes a little interesting when people talk about a former job that I used to have as the Deputy IG of the Army. That's usually a good conversation stopper. But, uh, but anyway, thank you for the kind introduction. So before I discuss Space, Space Command, and the importance of the total force, I would like to reflect on the recent events in Afghanistan for a moment. It certainly has been a difficult for, for all of the Americans, but in particular, for those that have served in Afghanistan. And I'm sure many of you in this facility this morning, this conference room, have served there. I know it's challenging to watch the events unfold, such as the loss of our U.S. service members this past Thursday and the remarkable efforts of the forces to evacuate both U.S. forces and, Afghanis and Afghanis. For the past 20 years, America and our allies have gone above and beyond the call of duty attempting to better the lives of roughly 38 million Afghan citizens and protect the homeland from terrorism. This noble sacrifice of thousands of men and women at arms, their families and our civilian counterparts are in keeping with our shared values of duty and patriotism. So this morning, I wanna thank each and every one of you for your selfless service to our military and our great nation. Please join me in a round of applause. So now I'd like to shift focus from our nation's warfighting activities on the ground to our past, present, and future warfighting efforts in the space domain. Two years ago today, the 29th of August, 2019, we stood up United States Space Command as the nation's newest and 11th combatant command. Needless to say, it has been very busy and transformational for two years. And we would not have been where we are today without the total force effort of the National Guard. So as we get ready to kick off here and spend a few more minutes discussing with you, I thought I'd show a short video that hopefully will inspire you a little bit this morning as well as give you kind of a broader context of what we do each and every day at US Space Command in terms of doing external messaging to the American citizen as well as our allies and partners on the important of space. So indulge me for just a couple of minutes here. Please roll the film. There was a time, not long ago, when life was so We stayed close to home, connected in person, and all the while we looked to the stars. But time moves forward. As we know it is anything but simple. Our world is Thank more you. connected now than ever before. A globalized network Thank of you. commerce, communications, travel, and industry. Technology has transformed the way we do business, the way we go to school, the way we shop, the way we socialize, even the way we sleep. We hold an entire world of knowledge in the palms of our hands. Today, the average smartphone has more processing power than all the computers NASA used to send astronauts to the moon. No matter where we go, the devices we own in our daily lives are always with us, working seamlessly. But before anything can happen down here, it must first happen up here.
Space is a conduit that connects every system in our global network. Satellite technology powers virtually every aspect of our digital lives. Every time you take a drive, order dinner, or visit the ATM, our global positioning system is hard at work connecting the dots, keeping the planes on point and the trains on time. You can track your package, you can track your progress, you can even track your best friend. Space helps us make new connections and it keeps us connected to the ones we love. But that's not all, because our assets in space impact almost every aspect of our daily lives, helping to power the economy from your own personal accounts to the global markets. The financial world runs on space technology, from humble startups to titans in industry. When commerce is on the move, space makes it happen. 90% of all transportation on planet Earth takes place across our oceans, and 100% of all maritime navigation depends on global positioning technology. This means that every import, every export, every provider, and every customer relies on space to get their products to the right place at the right time. Space also works as a global asset for science, providing researchers the tools they need to protect and conserve our natural world. And when disaster strikes, we are always prepared to track danger, predict peril, and face challenges, no matter what form they may take. From those who protect and serve to those who save lives, we ensure that our most valuable treasures will always remain safe. The work we do is faster, smarter, safer, and more efficient. We rely on this technology to keep the lights on and the engines running. So eventually, we have to ask one very important question. What would happen if our space assets ever came under attack? What if space was no longer the peaceful domain it once was? Fortunately, this is where we come in. The United States Space Command serves to protect our way of life as we know it. We are the warriors of the space domain. We deter aggression, we defeat our nation's enemies, we defend U.S. and allied partner interests, and we deliver the next generation of space combat power. We stand ready, just like we always have from the very beginning. Because no matter what our adversaries throw at us, we will fight and we will win. So, the next time you take a trip, read the tradition, get a checkup, call a friend, or visit home. Be sure to look up and always remember, there is never a day without space. All right, thank you. And that, the purpose of that video is really to, to demonstrate how reliant we are upon space in our daily lives. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as I go along here. But uh, to ensure that we never have a day without space, this nation took two major or giant steps in the establishment, reestablishment of the United States Space Command. And if you recall, we say reestablishment or we stood up again because there was a United States Space Command from 1985 to 2002, and that was the old U.S. Space Command. But the nation said, because of the threat that we see, because of the competitors that we see from Russia and China now, particularly in the space domain, that we needed a combatant command, the 11th Combatant Command. And now, as I said, today is our birthday, the 29th of August, 2019. We are two years old today. And then a few months after that, they stood up the United States Space Force as the sixth service of the United States Government Department of Defense. That, those are two very big and powerful decisions that were made on behalf of the American citizens and really in support of our allies and partners around the world. So it is extremely important that we understand that because we have taken those steps to ensure that we do have a safe, peaceful space domain. So I think it's motivating that on Space Command's second birthday, the commander of our nation's newest commander, me, is speaking to the members of what? Our nation's oldest military forces. Whether it's years, decades, or centuries of history among the branches of our armed services, none of them hold a candle to our nation's oldest military force, the National Guard, right? Cool. 13 December was 1636, so that's you. That's all of you in this room. 
You, you go all the way back to your roots as the, militias, as the militia was established at Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1636, nearly a century and a half before the United States Army. And as critical as you were then, I have seen firsthand the continued importance and impact of the total force contribution to U.S. Space Command today. And I look forward to sharing my perspective of the direct impact you have on my command while paying tribute to your own origins and experience. So I think it's fitting I'm here representing the newest nation's combatant command, speaking to those carrying on the strict legacy of our earliest combatants. Those early warriors carried matchlock muskets, also known as Newtown muskets. Only one exists today on public display, and it just happens to be the very first item in the permanent collection of military history in the Smithsonian's American History Museum in Washington, D.C. Imagine, though, the technological advancements that have occurred between the days when our warriors carried Newtown muskets to what we have today in space. I don't think those early guardsmen could even have imagined what we have in today's military, especially what we have in the space domain. Communication satellites, GPS, cameras on orbit capable of reading signs on the Earth and any number of extraordinary technological advancements, and that the amazing guardsmen would see or have access to those exquisite capabilities. But today's guardsmen do, and they do often. And as the video we saw highlights, you and I rely on space-based capabilities for, Amer for the American way of life as well as the American way of war. And you know this because you are in, you're in a unique position to see it from the three focal points of Guard members, your civilian roles, inherent in being true citizen soldiers, your defense support to civil authorities, and your war fighting missions when activated. U.S. Base Command is better at executing our mission because of the perspectives you all bring through experience in all three of those roles. What's so ex interesting, though, is how much space enables successful operations in all three segments. You, as much as anyone, fully understands the concept behind my vision, and that vision is that we never have a day without space. And as a result, given one of your primary imperatives of protecting the homeland, you're in a unique position to understand the significance of space to the well-being of this great nation. Let me see if I can provide a few examples of how space enables those three mission segments, civilian life, DISCA, and warfighting operations. And along the way, I'll give you a few updates on the progress of U.S. Space Command since we stood up two years ago today, along with a sense of where we are going. First, as you are true citizen soldiers, you understand the critical space, critical space is to our daily lives of Americans. You came from all over the United States today to gather here. And in general, it's pretty easy to get here from any part of the United States, and for that matter, any part of the world. But no one got here today without the benefit of space in some way, shape, or fashion. From the use of your cars, map, and navigation functions enabled by the GPS constellation operated by our great U.S. Space Force guardians just east of Colorado Springs at Schriever, now Space Force Base. It was Schriever Air Force Base, but renamed in the last month or so, Schriever Space Force Base, to pulling some cash out of an ATM machine at a gas station, or maybe even more importantly, an ATM machine just outside here as you head to the gambling floor. All of those capabilities are enabled by space. So beyond civilian life, I also know that you're aware of value how valuable space is to your support to civil authorities. I continue to admire and respect the work of our guardsmen around the country when disaster strikes. Earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, forest fires, even global pandemics. If disaster strikes, our National Guard warriors are there to help relieve suffering, restore law and order, provide logistical support, enhance command and control, and open lines of communication. One of many examples of how space capabilities assist these efforts is through satellite communications, moving information around the globe seamlessly from various sources. A second example is the use of space-based weather satellites providing data in real time. 
which is happening as I deliver these remarks this morning in support of Hurricane Ida. Just this month, my good friend Dan Hokinson was featured prominently in an Army.mil article on the Guard's outstanding efforts to help control blazing wildfires on the West Coast. He outlined the substantial role Guardsmen from California, Idaho, Oregon, Washington, Montana, Nevada, and Wyoming are playing in firefighting efforts across the Western United States. No doubt when General Hokuson spoke about the mobile airborne fire, firefighting system, he realized that those critical flight operations used in the fight against wildfires are enhanced by space-based capabilities. Everything from satellite communications to command and control to GPS-enabled flight navigation to remote sensing for geolocating the fire's center of gravity and any number of additional critical tasks. Our guardsmen know how space enables every facet of civilian life. They also know how space enables critical defense support to civil authorities when ensuring the safety and security of our homeland. And I am certain they know the role of space in support of the Guard's warfighting operations. So that's, as a vital, that's a vital and important role without a doubt. But as I've discussed, the value of space and its role in your three main areas of focus, warfighting, DISCA, and your civilian role, I think is also important, or just as important, to think about the major shift in the focus of U.S. Space Command since its establishment two years ago in 2019. This shift in focus serves as a foundation to understand the value of space to the Guard and the, numer or the enormous value of the Guard to United States Space Command. Specifically, how fully engaged the National Guard has been right alongside the active force in continuous combat operations around the world, but especially in Afghanistan and in Iraq since 2001. In many cases, since Desert Shield and Desert, Shore, uh, Desert Shield, Desert Storm. But even more than all of that, what really impresses me most is how well the Guard has evolved to meet the needs of the nation. Since the establishment of the Massachusetts militia almost four centuries ago to today's current operations, the evolution of the Guard has matched the evolution of our strategic environment. That's why I'm pleased that the Guard is such an integral part of U.S. Space Command's mission capability. We established U.S. Space Command to address major changes in the strategic environment and to deal with the implication of those changes for the space domain. Having a mission partner like the Guard to help us with that evolution is paramount, absolutely paramount to our success. I mentioned earlier how much we rely on space for the American way of life and the American way of war. Since space fuels our success in both, but such dependency, as we can all admit, creates vulnerability. Competitors and potential adversaries, namely China and Russia, and some others too, are working on capabilities that exploit those very vulnerabilities. The threats imposed by an increasingly competitive, congested, and contested space domain are what led the nation to establish United States Space Command and as I said, shortly thereafter, after the United States Space Force. Both organizations are singularly focused on deterring aggression and defending this great nation, our allies, and U.S. interests against hostile acts in space. And in keeping with the direction from the Goldwater-Nichols Act of 1986, the U.S. Space Force organizes, trains, and equips space warfighting fo forces, and they present those capable warfighting for forces, along with the Army, Marine Corps, Navy, and the Air Force to United States Space Command to conduct deterrence operations and other space operations to protect and defend U.S. and allied interests in the space domain. So since our establishment two years ago today, U.S. Space Command has been working on what's necessary for our command to execute the mission sets charged to me in the Unified Command Plan. Just this past week at the 36th Annual Space Symposium in Colorado Springs, I announced that U.S. Space Command has reached initial operational capability. I explained how we were able to reach that decision, that we had achieved an institutional IOC. And in that, I used an example. And the example that I used was the 2017-2018 
Las Vegas Golden Knights. Any fans in here of the Golden Knights? All right, just checking. They were made up of an experienced veteran players acquired in the NHL's expansion, expansion draft, if you recall. Based on taking seasoned veterans, the Knights were game ready before they even took to the ice for the very first time. By opening day, and certainly by the All-Star break, they were initially capable as a playoff team. And unfortunately, they proved it very early in the season in October of 2017, when they crushed my Avs, my Colorado Avalanche, seven to zero. And they proved it again by getting all the way to the Stanley Cup Finals in their first year. So I use this example because it serves as a good analogy for U.S. Space Command. As we went through, as we were able to get a group of veteran experienced warfighters from completely separate organizations to, and took it from a group of individuals coming together to a capable combatant command team in less than two years. And just as the Golden Knights had a successful expansion draft, so too did U.S. Space Command in 2018 and 2019, just prior to our stand-up. And just as the Knights had success right out of the gate as a new team, so, so too did U.S. Space Command as we marched towards IOC. But I also made larger point that our IOC declaration is merely the transition to a new phase in our goal to reach full operational capability. There are two critical points about this evolution of United States Space Command. First, we could not have established the command and reached IOC without our reserve component. And second, we will not be successful in re reaching FOC without you either. Keep in mind, U.S. Space Command has two sets of mission imperatives. First, we provide supporting functions to the Joint Force. Those are what we call our enduring no-fail missions that have been going on for over 30 years now. They include things like position navigation timing, global satellite communications, theater and global missile warning, amongst many others. Second, which is new, we have supported functions. That is, responsibilities in our area of operations that require support from the rest of the Joint Force. That is what is new and different from the old U.S. Space Command, these supported functions. These functions include what's necessary to deter aggression in space and protect and defend U.S. and allied interests in the domain. And we conduct all of those operations with the forces provided to us by the services and execute them through two functional components. The first is the Joint Task Force Space Defense commanded by Major General Tom James at Schriever Space Force Base, Colorado. And the second is the Combined Forces Space Component Command at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California commanded by Major General Deanna Burt. As I said often, that mission execution is a joint, combined, and partnered approach to both our deterrence and our protect and defend imperatives. By that I mean our operations include representation from multiple service, services, both active and reserve components, our allies and partners, and our government and industry partners. What is important to me is that the Guard is a huge part of the bookends of that approach, the joint and partnered approach portions of our team, through both your roles in uniform as well as your civilian citizen roles. So let me give you just a few examples of how the Guard in their uniform roles has helped so much in U.S. Space Command's efforts to field critical military space capabilities. So it starts at the very top. We have three National Guard general officers currently assigned to U.S. Space Command. Major General Tim Lawson, who I think is here today, as well as Brigadier General Ryan Okahara, who is here today. And now Colonel Promotable Jesse Morehouse as well. So let's give him a round. And I'd be remiss, of course, if I didn't mention Brigadier General Sean Bratton, or some of you may know him as Governor, formerly my DJ3, who has now moved on to take command of the Space Forces Space Training and Readiness Command, or STARCOM. That's kind of a cool name, right? STARCOM? Even now, as a Space Force asset, Gov will, be the, will still be central to U.S. Space Command's operational capability 
He will be the key Space Force commander for training and testing space combat forces for eventual presentation to U.S. Space Command. And we have a lot of other reserve component personnel embedded throughout the command as well. More than 60 personnel are on full-time orders and a total of 185 are supporting the command between full and part-time personnel. Beyond those personnel, the Guard provides outstanding capability in a number of space mission areas, including space and ground missile warning, electronic warfare, space command and control, ISR, and SATCOM. With a little over 1,000 airmen, 14 National Guard squadrons from seven states and one territory provide capability in these critical mission operation areas. Let's hear it. Cool. That's a large portion of the combat power in U.S. Space Command today. Now the Colorado National Guard's 117th Space Battalion has been, has been engaged for more than two decades with Army space support teams providing critical supporting functions to joint combat operations throughout the Middle East. The 117th's current commander is Lieutenant Colonel Robert Mendez. Is Robert here today? Let's give him a round. And Robert has been with U.S. Space Command even before the beginning. So he came to us from U.S. Strategic Command as one of the folks that volunteered to come stand up a new 11th Combatant Command. He spent a significant amount of time away from his family so that he could do things selflessly for U.S. Space Command and the organization before U.S. Space Command and now in U.S. Space Command. So it's, we're very proud of the fact that he has been selected to be the commander of the 117th. Additionally, with our, uh, space service our Army Space Service Component Command, which is U.S. Army Space and Missile Defense Command, we have the first Space Brigade. And the reason I bring that up is, uh, well, one, I used to be the commander of SMDC, so I always want to bring up your old unit. But the fact that that brigade has both an active duty battalion, a reserve battalion, and the 117th all in the same brigade, I think, demonstrates, and I've seen it work for many years, how we can have all three components working under a single commander and the combat power that that generates is phenomenal. So I think it's worth pointing that out. So we've grown significantly since the first wave of these personnel as they walk through our door. And that growth includes developing a solid representation of our reserve component. Out of approximately 585 military personnel today at US Space Command, about 60, as I previously mentioned, or just over 10%, are, for, are from the reserve component on full-time orders supporting the headquarters, including about a dozen and a half from the Guard. Eventually, we will have six full-time AGR positions on the books for a solid, permanent presence of our Guard teammates. These warfighters are spread throughout the, virtually every directorate in my headquarters. They've been a critical part of our ability to execute our mission, and they were a key part of our team responsible for getting us to IOC, and they'll even be more important to us as we continue towards FOC. One of the things I found most interesting about my experience as an Army officer, and as you can see, I am old, over the past three decades, was how fully integrated the reserve component was into our operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. In fact, they were so well integrated that commanders on the ground saw little, if any, distinction between the active and the reserve components. That's how it should be. One mission, one fight, with the sources of our warfighting capability transparent once engaged in mission operations. So fast forward to today. Now I am a joint officer, if you will, with the honor and the privilege of leading this great combatant command. And this view of integration is what I expect for U.S. Space Command too. It's easy to see that given how vast and complex U.S. Space Command's area of operations is, it's apparent we cannot go it alone. And just to, find, just to define our area of operation, our area of operation is defined as 100 kilometers or roughly 62 or so nautical miles to infinity, right? That's a big space. And if you know a little bit about space, it's actually growing. So, uh, so now I get to sit with the other 10 combatant commanders, one in particular who thought that they had the largest area of responsibility, and now today I can successfully and, and emphatically declare that I have the largest area of operations. 
So that's why we signed, you know, in terms of what we look towards in the future, that's why we've signed more than 100 data sharing agreements with our allies, intergovernmental and academic partners, for example. These agreements I mentioned are to exchange information among partners to enhance our space domain awareness, increase the safety of space flight operations, and really lay the foundation for future collaboration in space operations with these key team teammates. This is great progress, but we can and we must do even more. Fortunately, we have the experience of our reserve component and our guard teammates in particular. You have a solid framework and outstanding experience in building just those kind of partnerships. The opportunities to US Space Command to leverage your experience is really limitless. With the help of Tim Lawson and Jesse Morehouse, US Spacecom is fully engaged in building the foundation of such relationships between the Guard and our command. The State Partnership Program in particular is a shining star of relationship building and allows access to a pool of military expertise that is not available anywhere else in the Department of Defense. I'm here to tell you that the creation of such a partnership between the National Guard and our command is already underway with some great initial results to show for our efforts together. At first, we thought we would focus on just one partnership as a proof of concept, but the great folks at the NGB J53, NGB Space Operations, multiple state SPP offices, and NGB SPP LNOs have enthusiastically kick-started this initiative and grown it rapidly. Currently, we have a draft SPP CONOPS in coordination for SPP engagements in various stages of execution and more engagements on the way. I'd like to thank California, Florida, New York, Ca South Carolina, Texas, Washington, and West Virginia for their willingness to leverage relationships in support of these initiatives. We're well on our way, as I just described, to building the synergy between US Space Command and SPP. This all fits perfectly with US Spacecom's intent to provide options for our whole of government approach to addressing the challenges of the space domain. I have maintained all along that the Guard is in a unique position to fully understand just how deep space-based capabilities are embedded in the American way of life and the American way of war. I am convinced of that more and more each day. Your use of space capabilities in warfighting operations and DISCA operations, as well as citizen soldiers and airmen, provides US Spacecom exactly what it needs to enhance our mission ex execution and our readiness. You all bring a unique, enduring, broad, and critical perspective on how best to use the total force to achieve what the President's Interim National Security Strategic Guidance compels us, which is to ensure the safety, stability, and security of our outer space activities. You bring us the perspective, the experience, and capabilities to deter aggression and defend the nation, our allies, and U.S. interests against hostile acts in space. You are, and always will be, our partners in the execution of our mission. We are a stronger force as a total force. So as I wrap up here, I'll say that's my story, and I'm absolutely sticking to it. I want to thank you this morning for the opportunity to speak to you, and I look forward to our continued cooperation and collaboration in the defense of this great nation. I look forward in, part in our partnership in ensuring that there is never a day without space and I will leave you with, may God bless you and may God bless this great nation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, General Dickinson. We appreciate it. We're gonna jump down here and get a quick uh, photo with the C-130. <laughs> Visiting the South Pole. I'm sure you got space coverage there as well. Come on down. Well, thanks again. Will the uh, Sergeant at Arms please uh, come to the platform and uh, escort our distinguished visitor and his escorts 
off the stage. 